Rare earths are a group of um, 17 metals, uh, 15 lanthosides, um, and two others that are a similar metal in terms of chemical composition. Rare earths are in fact not that rare. Okay, so they're, they're pretty abundant in the earth's crust. In fact, as abundant as copper. Uh, the challenge is, is finding them in sufficient enough concentrations to make it commercially viable to dig them out of the ground um, and then to process them. Now, the other really important thing to remember about rare earths, it's not like pulling iron ore out of the ground or coal. Digging the hole, the mining bit, is important. Um, no doubt about that and finding it. Um, realistically though, it's a metallurgical process um, of refinement. And so there's a really, really long value chain of, uh, which involves a series of chemical um, activities and refinements. Um, so when we talk about the rare earths, what we have to really do is not just talk about it in terms of these things that we, these 17 metals we dig out of the ground, but we have to look at it in context of the value chain and the economics. Where is this stuff used? Well, if I said to you everywhere, and most people touch it, so look, here in my iPhone today, I have eight um, rare earth elements in my mobile phone. Um, you know, there's a couple hundred kilos of rare earth elements um, in a joint strike fighter. Um, there's probably some rare earth elements in your fridge at home. So look, they're everywhere is one thing to say, but realistically and where it gets really important is they're right in the middle and the heart of both defense and commercial industry and at the cutting edge of that technology. Um, so if you think about it, they're in missile guidance systems, so that's that defense side. And on the other side, which is, um, which is sort of exciting for the majority of, of people, um, which is they go into the engines that make wind turbines. They go into MRI machines. They're used to make the high tech chips and capacitors that go into our computers and other technological equipment. Um, interestingly, they go into the latest generation of batteries for storing power. Um, so these things are really critical to the future uh, of society, the future of green tech and the future of defense and national security. Um, rare earth elements, or the global rare earth element market um, and value chain, are really a great case study of what we see more broadly of this great power competition. Uh, we see a Chinese Communist Party um, that has invested a long time ago in identifying that um, the market was of incredible value. Uh, what we saw then is them dominate that market. So what we saw is, is that 100% of the heavy rare earths produced uh, globally uh, are processed through mainland China. Depending on how you calculate it, somewhere between 48 and 80% of um, light rare earths processed through China. Um, now that wouldn't necessarily be a problem if we hadn't also seen on more than one occasion um, the Chinese Communist Party used that power to economically coerce others. Uh, 2012, uh, while the Japanese government and the Chinese Communist Party were arguing over issues in the South China Sea, um, almost overnight, without any further announcement, the Chinese Communist Party pulled a policy lever that denied access to rare earths to the Japanese manufacturing industry. Um, two years ago, very publicly discussions, both being um, launched by the Chinese Communist Party and um, Chinese Communist Party influenced companies. Um, what we saw then is this issues and discussions about whether or not uh, American defense industry would be cut off uh, from rare earth supplies. Uh, the issue was big enough a decade ago for the Japanese government to put significant equity investments in an Australian company, Linus. Um, we also saw over the last 12, 18 months, signing of an agreement between the US DOD and Linus to provide them. Um, so this is front and center of that great power competition that we're seeing. Um, it's of incredible economic importance and incredible defense importance. Um, for our defense people, this is about uh, being able to manufacture everything from missiles. And for our, other, for our people who are interested in other parts of policy, really this is everything from the, the wind turbines of um, wind farms through to solar panels, uh, through to electric motors, through to um, MRI machines. Uh, so this is really front and centre economic competition, front and centre geopolitics. Look, we're really, really lucky. So let's let's talk um, Earth's crust. 
Um, we have a lot of rare earths. Um, the challenge is this is the nature of the market and um, first off the demand. So the demand is very uneven. So what happens is quite often you'll have a demand for a certain rare earth, it'll go really, really high, then drop off for an extended period of time. Um, secondly is that, as I said at the start, rare earth's hard to find in concentrated places so you we can find enough of it to process. Um, raising equity um, is really, really difficult in the market. So if you're an investor looking at rare earths and you sit there and see um, what's happened with the market, um, the dominance by Chinese com the Chinese Communist Party, um, that investment looks really quite risky at times. Um, here we're lucky, so let's go through it. Um, 10 years ago or over a decade ago we saw Japanese investment in Linus. Uh, Linus has got operations in Australia, it's got operations in Malaysia, um, it's supplying now the US market with some rare earths. Um, going to go and start up an operation in um, South Australia, uh, it's going to be um, uh, including some processing. Uh, we see other parts of, of the industry, um, a large uh, companies like Aluka who've been in the mining game for a long period of time. They're doing some great work and going to do that work in Western Australia, um, provided with um, equity investment from the Australian government, um, really going forward. However, what we also see is this sort of this grouping of about 20 or 30 different companies who are trying to do small mines all across Australia um, with very, um, very thin um, equity themselves. So they're out there always trying to raise money to move their projects further along. Um, I was remit there's also Arafura in the Northern Territory, which is moving forward and looking at how they can be part of that about process. So we're in a good spot in terms of finding this stuff in the ground. Um, we're in a challenging spot in terms of raising money to get it out of the ground. Um, but we're still not moving along that value chain. Now, of course, there's some people in Australia talking about it in terms of, let's go for the moonshot, okay? So let's go to making um, chips and uh, things like that. I think we need to stop short of that. I think the solution there is moving along that metallurgical process and seeing us make magnets, um, seeing us make batteries. Look, I think the evidence has really proven over the last um, just over a decade, we're incredibly vulnerable. And when I say we, I'm talking about uh, Western liberal democracies and the broader market to economic coercion um, in the rare earth element market. Um, there's no other way to describe it than that. Um, now, what we should do about that, um, you know, we are part of a value chain um, as it stands at the moment. And I think the secret here is, is that there's things that the Australian government can do on its own and it's doing that, for instance, in its investment in Aluka. Uh, but I feel that the real secret to this is bringing together um, a mini lateral grouping of like-minded countries. Um, certainly, there's been some great signalling from the Japanese market and the Japanese government about an interest in continuing to invest in rare earth in Australia. Um, and certainly, as we saw with a recent agreement signed between the US and, um, and Linus, we see a great deal of interest from the defence industry. Um, but what we really need to do, I think, is, is think a little bit bigger than that. Um, I think that we need to think here about let's move from just digging holes in the ground and moving that unprocessed ore. Um, let's look about how we move across that value chain. Um, and as I said earlier, let's look at how we become, go back into uh, manufacturing, but not in a 1980s build a car perspective, um, but in terms of industry 4.0 and in terms of being a powerhouse in new green technology. The obvious question here for people listening and watching this is, so what are we doing about this big problem? So we've touched on a little bit about investments and other things. Um, and look, we're awakening to this problem. Um, most certainly, like most nations, uh, Australia and, uh, and its partners in Japan, the US, um, really bought into globalisation and just-in-time supply chains. Now, we're waking up to that that has to change and that sovereignty and resilience mean something quite different. Um, we've also woken up to the fact that market forces are not going to fix that. That is why the Australian government earlier this year announced its investment in Aluka. Uh, a lot more work needs to be done in this space in terms of um, at the national level, in terms of research and development, in terms of mining and exploration, um, in terms of investment. Um, and about insulating ourselves uh, from unfair competition.
But the real secret in this and the secret source of where we go next is working with our colleagues in a mini lateral sense. So working with countries of like-minded who've identified this problem early, like Japan, um, like the US, uh, and indeed like India, and working out how we develop our own rare earth industries. Um, the great opportunity here for Australia is, is moving from being just the suppliers of ore to being part of that manufacturing process and that solution. Um, but that will require some really big thinking and a, a change of mindset from all involved. Um, however, there is very clear signs that that mindset is changing right now.